So, um, welcome everybody, um, the, the capstone class. We call this the public policy mixtape. So we talk Thank about you. policy, we talk about um, trajectory, career, uh, you got to be a decision maker, um, and so so thank you. This is uh, uh, for not just for the public policy uh, capstone class, but also for the Roosevelt House Institute uh, of Public Policy. So um, thank you so much for coming, Anthony. Thanks Hoberman, for inviting me. Yeah. Um, everyone is a senior advisor to the mayor of the city of New York, and um, I really so I'm glad you're here, and I wanted to just start out like uh, James Lipton in Actors Studio. We're going to begin at the beginning. Um, so where are you from? Uh, I grew up in Woodbridge, New Jersey, which is about 20 minutes south of Newark. So, you know, not far from New York. Um, and, uh, you know, grew up uh, uh, coming into the city a lot as a kid and, and you know, always really loved it. You know, and you went to, where did you go to, where did you go to undergrad? Went to Cornell. Does that fellow, sound fellow fellow we, yeah. Yes, we're, we're uh, Cornell alum. Not there exactly. at the same time, I'm a little older. <laughs> Um, I have a little vintage, um, but um, so you graduated when? I graduated in 2004. 2004, mm -hmm. and from there? From there, so I had been working, you know, kind of as an intern in New Jersey government and a little bit of uh, political campaigns throughout college. Were and you interested in, in politics in that time? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I had a sense from, I think, kind of a pretty young age that it was like a, you know, a... a, a Something I, I you know, definitely wanted to, to at least consider pursuing. Um, I remember, I have kind of an early memory, I don't know, it was probably three or four of, um, you know, being, you know, in the living room with my, my parents and some others, and Ronald Reagan was president at the time, and like, he came on TV for kind of a cut-in, you know, address of some kind, and everyone stopped talking. Mm -hmm. And I remember sort of like, like asking, like, what, like, what's going on? They're like, that's the president. And I was like, well, if... if if the adults stop talking, this must be important. And like, if, if it's if it's you know that important, then like that must be the thing that you do if you want to do something big, you know. So I I, I kind of I was always a little bit uh, uh, interested in it, and then um, you know ended up kind of lucking into an internship my senior year in high school, and then you know I think as a lot of us do, sort of parlayed that into other opportunities. And so when I graduated Cornell, um, I had. Worked in um, the New Jersey Governor's Communications Office with someone who had done Advance, which is you know a, a event logistics and and set up for um, the the Gore campaign in two thousand, and she recommended me for the Kerry campaign. I was the general at that point in two thousand four, and so I, I that was kind of my my first gig out of college and, and again sort of you know jump from one to the, the other and, and never really looked back did you major in political science no you know I was I was an English major and um, and an actor actually I spent an probably actor. more time acting I at, did at not college know than Is that yeah, right? I remember, yeah and oh. and so that was um, and Cor Cornell didn't really have a full-time acting program it was more of like a comprehensive theater arts degree where you would study you know, you, you, you could focus, obviously, but you would take, you know, classes in scenic design and, and, you know, audio engineering and stage management and all this kind of stuff. And so, I didn't, you know, I didn't really want to go that route, but that was kind of my passion. And I, I sort of, um, you know, during the semester I was doing that, when I was home, I was, I was you know, interning in, in government offices. Wasn't really sure until I graduated what I was going to, you know, want to keep going with and, and ended up uh, uh, doing the campaign and, and, you know, going from there. So, the governor's office? Yep. Came with communications? Yes. What was that? What's that like? You were doing communications for a governor of the state. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, you know, as a as a young person, you know, starting really at like seventeen, eighteen, and then through college. I mean, it was, it was incredible, and it was a, a you know, it was a, it was a great opportunity. I think to, um, you know, really see up close just how fast paced government operates. I think you know, the folks who have never worked in the public sector, I think there's sometimes a a misconception that like government is inherently slow and inefficient and you know compared to the private sector my experience frankly has been almost the opposite like nothing moves quite at the pace of government political campaigns right the the, the degree to which you have to really just make you know quick decisions and uh, uh, you know implement things in response to what's happening in the world there's like really no comparison so that was amazing and, you know and also honestly having the opportunity to keep going back there during my winter and summer breaks for, for, you know, about three or so years when, when, you know, after I started in the governor's office specifically, 
that was really great because I actually got to develop relationships mm -hmm. and they started to, people who had been in the office for, for a lot of that time, um, started to kind of trust me, um, you know, almost more like a, a pretty junior level member of the staff as opposed to an intern who was maybe going to be gone in a few weeks. And so I got to work on some, some really cool stuff and actually get a taste for what the work is really like. So you like wet your appetite and... Um... So what was the next move after that? So yeah, so I did the I did the Kerry campaign that ended. That was 04. That was 04. Um, and you know, was not not 04 was not a great year for Democrats. So a, a you know a young, relatively experienced Democratic operative, people weren't really banging down my door. Um, and so I from there, um, you know, substitute taught for a little bit, and then ended up again someone who I'd worked with on the Kerry campaign. Um, reached out to me because they were looking for someone to do advance on a New York City mayor's race in 2005. It was Gifford Miller, who was the right. city council speaker at the time. And that was kind of my jump to New York politics and then was able to, you know, again, that, that, that was not a successful campaign, but um, he brought me on to the city council staff afterwards uh, uh, and, you know, during his last few months as speaker. And I, I was able to kind of stick around and make the transition and ended up spending eight years working there when uh, Christine Quinn was, was speaker. So I really ended up kind of doing, you know, most of my 20s um, mm -hmm. at the city council. And you were, and you were doing, you were doing policy and interacting with the members of the council from other parts of the city. Yeah, I mean, over the course of the eight years, I sort of was in a few different roles. I, I you know, I started off as just kind of a you know, junior press officer where, you know, I didn't even really have a lot of interaction with the speaker early on, you know, the press secretary and the communications director kind of handled that. But there's, you know, there's there's 50 other members of the city council. There are 40 some odd committees and subcommittees. And so they, they kind of divvied up amongst four or five of us um, these portfolios that, that involved kind of managing those issues and also the committee hearings from a, you know, a, a media relations and communications perspective. And I think a few of us that were particularly kind of like young and hungry, like saw that as an opportunity to just, you know, get as aggressive as possible and like try to get media to cover and come up with creative ways to amplify, you know, stuff that, that historically didn't necessarily get a lot of attention, but was important. Like one that I always remember that, that, you know, was pretty successful was, you know, the youth services committee didn't necessarily get a lot of reporters coming to the hearings. But we did a tour of a, uh, a, a youth homeless shelter, a shelter for, for largely you know, LGBTQ plus um, uh, uh, young people. Um, and you know, we're able to bring a couple cameras with us and sort of tell the story of the work through that lens. Um, so that was sort of where I started. And then over the course of my time there, you know, kind of moved up to more of like a senior advisor role. Did a lot more of the long-term strategic planning. You know, for a while I kind of sat at the intersection of like communications, public policy, um, you know, event planning, scheduling, sort of liaising between a lot of folks who focused there to try to make sure that we were actually, you know, thinking more than a few days out, which can be very, very hard when you're, you know, in government or politics. Now talk about the, the role that the media plays in amplifying policy, because policy might be great, but if nobody knows it, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's right. I mean, look, I, I think of it a few different ways. Like one, at you know, at a very fundamental level, um, if you know, if you are an elected official or you are part of a, you know an elected administration or office, um, whatever you want to accomplish, you only get to accomplish it if you stay in office. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to get to stay in that role or move up to the next level, maybe you're a council member and you want to run for borough president or you want to run for Congress or you want to, you know, you're a borough president, you want to be mayor. The only way you're going to make those jumps is if you're actually telling the stories of what you're doing to impact people in a positive way. And so, you know, I think people sometimes look at it a little callously that it's like, oh, you're just kind of always campaigning for the next office and you're always worried. Like that's sort of fundamental to the way the, the political system is designed and, you know, you can have disagreements about it, but, but, you know, so much of, of, the, the job requires kind of re-auditioning for mm. that job over and over again. So mm. that's sort of one, like, you know, I would say overarching piece. The other thing is I, 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 I think sometimes folks underestimate the degree to which public policy is driven by public opinion. Mm. And, you know, I can't tell you how many things, you know, I've either worked on or seen over the course of, of my time doing this that, 
were really great ideas or really important. But, you know, as with so many big ideas, were contentious and had, you know, loud voices and in some cases even valid perspectives on both sides. And if the, you know, if the opposition is able to do a better job of, of telling their story and, and kind of framing the narrative around the, the, the issue, then, you know, it's going to die on the vine. Mm. And it's never going to get off the ground. And, and, you know, conversely, there's a whole universe of advocates and service providers that are trying to get, you know, New Yorkers to pay attention so that then when, you know, the governor or the mayor or the legislatures are, are setting their policy agenda for the year, they know, like, this is front of mind, right? Like, what, what do we need to solve right now? You think about in New York City, we need to solve for, you know, public safety people are really concerned about affordable housing people are really concerned about, right, impact of the pandemic on the schools and so many other things, right? And how do we make those determinations? Mm. A, a lot of it's, you know, what you hear from your constituents. And so if you're not shaping that conversation, your issue is not going to rise to the top of the pile. And there's only so much, you know, anyone can get done in a, in a given legislative session or term. So. And then when we met, you had, you by that time you had left um, uh, the council Mm -hmm. And you were working at Marathon Strategies. Yeah, so I did, bounced around a little bit between then, did some, you know, state-level work, campaigns, etc. I was three years heading public affairs for the city's Economic Development Corporation. And then, yeah, I, I, in about 2018, I left, you know, government and government, uh, uh, you know, kind of adjacent roles to, um, to go into consulting for a few years. And that was, you know, a very different experience, really, really educational, really great. How was it different? Well, I mean, for one thing, you're... Besides the pay. <laughs> <laughs> that is one thing. Uh, for one thing, you know, you're working with, um, you know, uh, for, for most consultants, you're working with, uh, you know, a bunch of different clients, right? Some, you know, if you're in a larger agency and you have, um, you know, maybe one particularly large corporate or nonprofit, there are people that have one client, but most of us, you know, at any given moment, you're working with anywhere from six to 15 different clients and... You know, some have more needs than others, some have larger budget than others, and you try to allocate your time accordingly. But, you know, look, in, in, in government, on campaigns, you're dealing with dozens, if not hundreds, of different things at any given moment. But you're sort of, you know, everyone's kind of laddering up to one person, and there's a little bit of a clearer true north as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas, and a set end date. <laughs> right. Well, that's, yeah, that's true too, exactly. Yeah. Whereas with, you know, with the, with the consulting, you really do have to, you know, try to balance and make sure that you're, you know, serving all of these different clients well. Um, and there's also, you know, I think, I think there's, uh, it's easy to take for granted a little bit, you know, and, and it's true to different degrees for different audience, you know, different offices and levels. But, you know, people are very, very interested in what the mayor has to say on any given day. Right. Our challenge is not usually to get press coverage. Our, our challenge is to manage that coverage and try to focus it on good things that we're doing and, you know, right. that, that sort of thing. Right. Um, but for a lot of these, you know, a small nonprofit or a startup or, you know, whatever, um, those opportunities are not nearly as readily available. And so you have to get, I think, in some cases, even more creative to make sure that you're, you know, finding the right audience, figuring out what platform is you know most effective to reach that audience and like ultimately what's actually going to move the needle right mm -hmm. what's the, the the you know business or policy outcome they're trying to drive when you so in, in in the government on the government side and certainly on the on the consultant side and you may face this more how do you manage your own um, feelings emotions politics if you're in a position where you're asked to do something or advocate for something that you may not fully believe in yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's a little different for everybody. And, and, you know, for me, there are sort of levels, right? And, like, I, you know, I would I would never really work for a, you know, like, I mean, just for, for example, I, you know, with, with maybe a few very extreme exceptions, I'm, I'm, I'm a lifelong Democrat, right? I, I, I would not work for a, you know, Republican running for office in all likelihood, right? And, and, and you know, within even the party, you know, I'm not going to work for somebody that I fundamentally disagree with in court ways. Right. In terms of like my key values. Now, that said, I've never worked with or for anybody that I agreed with 100 percent on everything. And there's there's value in having distinct opinions within a staff. It's the, the job and responsibility of good staff, I think, to elevate those different perspectives. 
you know, at the end of the day, the principal has to make a decision whether they're, you know, an elected official or the CEO of a company. But having that debate, having that dialogue is, is essential. Um, and you don't, I mean, you know, I think we see, we see the outcomes when you have kind of monolithic thinking in any organization. And it's, you know, one of many reasons why there's such a focus on, on trying to, you know, increase representation to make sure that you're hearing from different people. You know, in, in consulting, I mean, I, you know, I, I, you know, I went to work for, for an agency that, you know, had certain types of clients that they were absolutely never going to take on, right? They're never going to work for a gun company. They're never going to work for a tobacco company. Right? There, there, there's, there's a, you know, sort of a list of those, um, those types of things. You know, I, I had some clients that, that, you know, I didn't necessarily agree with, with everything we worked on together. But the goal was always to try to find opportunities to, you know, if they were having an issue, if they were managing a crisis, to, to first and foremost try to fix whatever the issue might be that, that created the, the, you know, public relations challenge in the first place so we could then communicate that story, right? You can't, you can't fool people, right? If you're, right, right? if you're doing something and it ain't right and you get called out for it and you refuse to make any kind of change... The, the best PR team in the world is, is really not going to be able to move the needle for you that significantly. Um, mm-hmm. But I was fortunate I got to work with a lot of clients doing really, you know, really great, interesting work, you know, uh, uh, advocates working in the housing space and, and, you know, even companies that were trying to, you know, shape legislation in a way that wouldn't have, you know, negative unintended consequences that, that you know, might be damaging to, to jobs or actually undercut existing efforts. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's always a little bit of a balance. And now you're senior advisor to mayor. How'd that come about? Um, so, so when I I mentioned quickly, I was you know, I, I was at uh, the city's economic development corporation for a few years, um, from I think 2015 to 2018, and the first president that I worked with at at the the EDC um, uh, was a woman named Maria Torres Springer. Who left and and you know moved into a, a few other roles in the De Blasio administration, and then went to uh, the Ford Foundation. Um, but when Mayor Adams got elected, he he tapped her to be his deputy mayor for economic and workforce development. We we stayed you know fairly close. And when I saw that she got announced, I you know reached out, said congratulations. We got to talking, and it you know turned out that they had you know something that was a good fit and, and was interesting. So I, I started chatting with the communications director and we hit it off and, uh, you know, it seemed like a great opportunity to get back in. So, you know? so what's your day to do like now? So, uh, you know, because the mayor, you worked for the governor and you talked about how sort of intense that environment could be. Mm-hmm. But this is the mayor of New York City yeah. so that they say is the second hardest job in the country. Yep. Um, how's that? What's that like? It's. I mean, look. I. I. I love it. it you know. It, I wouldn't have come back in if I. You know. If I didn't know that that a part of me would love it, and also wasn't prepared for the. You know, kind of the absolute madness of, uh, of the pace and everything. Um, you know. It's. It's. You know. My. My role is kind of an interesting one because we sort of divide into. There's a press office that manages a lot of the day to day events and incoming reporter inquiries, and there's a smaller team of us you know, mostly a little bit more experienced, a little further along in our careers that are in the communications office. And our role is really intended. And again, everybody gets pulled into, to, you know, to stuff inevitably from time to time. But our role is to try to be able to stay a little bit more above the fray um, and carve out the space to actually plot a strategy and to think about, you know, what are the big things that we actually need to get done and get out into the world so that people know that we're actually being responsive to the challenges they're facing. More proactive than reactive. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, when it comes to the day of the press conference, frequently we, we hand things over, you know, we'll still be involved. But, we, yeah, we, you know, if, if everyone can only focus on what's immediately in front of them, mm-hmm. then you're, you're going to run into challenges. So we, that, that, that's sort of how it's split up a little bit. Um, but it's, I mean, it's been great. You know, I mean, this, this, this mayor keeps... Probably the most aggressive public schedule of anyone I've ever worked with. He's out, you know, early in the morning, um, you know, meeting with the workers and, and, and late at night <laughs> and everything in between. And um, it's, you know, it's uh, it can be tough to keep up with him. But I think we're, you know, we're getting a lot of stuff done. We've got a lot more to do. Uh, but it's it's been it's been great to be a part of it. And it's, you know, I, I, I was really enjoying what I was doing. But um, there's nothing quite like being in government and having the opportunity to be at City Hall working for the mayor, particularly at a time when... You know, New York really needs you know people focused on on the challenges of today, but also the future. Um, you know, it's an honor to be a part of that, honestly. And I want to open it up for any students that have any questions. But for on behalf of the students that are looking 
to get into public policy, have careers in government and politics and policy making. Um, as you reflect on the, the skill sets that you relied on, uh, relied upon over these years, like what, what keeps coming up for you? I mean, you know, I, it, it's, it's funny. I, I, I think a lot about, you know, one of the part of my portfolio is, is economic and workforce development. I do housing. I do, you know, a, a bunch of different stuff that's sort of within my, my remit. And, uh, but, you know, the, the, when, when we have conversations about, you know, workforce and, and, you know, how to both make sure that we're training and supporting people in need of, of skills so that they can get good jobs, but also like recognizing that companies want to be where talent is mm -hmm. and the center of a job creation strategy actually needs to be a talent pipeline and talent development. But there's so much focus on, you know, what I think for a while they, they kind of, so, you know, called soft skills and then realized that they're not soft at all, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that the, you know, ability to communicate effectively, the ability to work well and collaboratively with others, the, the you know, the ability to, um, you know, stay on track, but also shift focus where, where needed, like all, all of those things that, that kind of make one effective in almost any workplace, I think a lot of employers are starting to realize are, are just as important as maybe like what you think of as the core competency, competencies, whether that's writing in a job like mine or engineering if you're going, you know, sort of down a different track. So, you know, to me, it, it's... You know, and, and I, I, again, I was really fortunate in that I was able to get some experiences when I was, you know, when I was young and kind of coming up that really threw me into challenging situations. Um, I, I consider myself very fortunate. One of the first people I ever worked for was just the most calm, like, human I think I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. Just super even keeled. And, you know, government politics and particularly, like, press and communications can be an extremely chaotic environment. And I think sometimes people see busy and important people kind of running around very, very stressed out, and they, they learn the wrong lesson from that. Mm. The lesson they learn is, if I want people to think I'm important and busy, I have to run around snapping at people and acting like the world is going to collapse. Yeah. And I saw, I, you know, I, saw, I saw this guy, you know, really just, um, just be such a, a, a calm and collected presence that, that people would come to him and when there was a crisis or when there was something like he provided that, that kind of stability and I think I was able to learn from that and, and that's I think served me really well like people when, when things get challenging people look to someone who, who is you know looks like they're not panicking and has some sense of a path forward and I think you know whether, whether you are secretly panicking or not the ability to, to project that a little bit is, is huge and for full disclosure to that very point, yeah. we worked on. Our, we met. Um, we knew a lot of the same people, and we met yeah. on a mayoral campaign um, for a person that did not win, who is not mayor currently. Mm -hmm. um, Ray McGuire is public information, mm -hmm. and um, one of the challenges was to manage a campaign and to work on a campaign that was almost entirely on Zoom. Yeah, where we couldn't go out, or it took a long time for us to be able to go out. And actually meet voters because right. we were doing so much on Zoom, and um, and and uh, Anthony was the policy guru of the campaign. Um, but to your point about these sort of conversations, I mean, how many like conversations do we have at like one o'clock in the morning <laughs> and two o'clock in the morning? Yeah, right, right. Um, but it's like, oh my God, we got to get this thing out. Right. Um, so the, you know, campaigns are difficult, but you know, but the the I want to say reward, but I guess part of it is a reward, but the outcome. If you end up do, getting somebody or work with somebody who is elected, is that um, it is important work, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you will be up late at night thinking about things. I imagine that you, you maybe if nobody's calling you, that you're, <laughs> but you're 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 up late trying to think through like, is this going to work? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's honestly to your point, the you know one of the really rewarding things and I consider myself extremely fortunate to have you know gotten to work on the stuff that I have I mean you know and campaigns are really rewarding you know I think I think I think win or lose they 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 contribute a tremendous amount to the dialogue and getting to work with good people I mean you know for for any race there's always going to be a lot more folks that, that don't make it than than do but certainly like you know then getting the opportunity as as you know as I have now to you know contribute to actually helping run the city um yeah, it's 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 wonderful. It's also you know yeah, it, it is. Uh, there's always something on your mind, and you know, and, and and look, I think this is increasingly true in a 
you know, increasingly virtual world and, you know, with people shifting to, to hybrid work in some industries, it's, you know, I think more and more folks um, find themselves w without a clear kind of end point to mm -hmm. the day, to the work day or to the work week, right? Your phone can always go off. Um, and I think it's important to, to really find a way to balance, to, to carve out some mental space for yourself. Um, but I think if you, you know, if you do something you, 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 you care about, um, you're always going to have, you know, th th there's, you're never gonna be done, right? If you, if you do something that's challenging and that you care about, you're never gonna, uh, uh, at the end of a day or a week, be like, there was literally nothing else I could have done to be productive or contribute today. And you have to almost take, you know, take the moment and say, that, like, we're gonna have to stop here now, right. or you really can just drive yourself completely crazy. You know? now, talk about, did anybody have any questions before? I Talk about one of the things that you're like really proud of, some of the policy accomplishments, or accomplishments probably that you're really proud of in your career. Yeah, I mean, I, th th uh, there, there's there's a lot. I mean, one of the really most recent ones that I'm, I'm super excited about, and one of the things that I've been focusing a lot of my time at City Hall on is, you know, there are a lot of factors that contribute to the housing crisis we're in. But at its core, really, is a, a failure to build enough housing to meet demand, mm -hmm. right? And, and to meet kind of population shifts. And this is not, you know, unique to New York City. It, it has been happening in cities across the country for a while. And now, increasingly, we're seeing it happening in suburbs and small towns, right? And, you know, that is, again, a, a lot of factors, some, some, you know, unintended consequences of... of well-intended regulations to ensure that people weren't building things that were going to damage the environment or put the health of, of residents at risk. But we've ended up, you know, in, in New York and across the country with um, zoning codes that, again, in some cases, may, you know, may have been designed with good intentions. In some cases, we're actually designed with very explicit classist and racist intentions to keep certain people out of certain neighborhoods, to prevent people, you know, at lower incomes from being able to move to a neighborhood by preventing apartments from being built and keeping it only kind of, you know, single family residential. Um, and so one of the things we're really trying to tackle is, you know, we looked at the last couple of administrations who, who did tremendous work um, kind of moving the needle on, on financing affordable housing and, you know, devoted a, a lot of public resources to that. And yet, it feels like we, we take one step forward and 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 two steps backward, or the the you know the the, the goalposts keep moving is maybe mm -hmm. a better metaphor. Um, and so you know we find ourselves in a rent crisis. We find ourselves with um, you know a, a increasing uh, a homelessness crisis, which has only been exacerbated by the um, asylum seeker humanitarian crisis uh, that's that's happening right now. And like at the intersection of all these things is. There's not enough places to live, and not enough places to live, particularly for people at lower incomes. So, anyway, just to, to make a long story short, you know, I've been really focused on going back to the point of like shaping public opinion and shaping the narrative. Part of why it's hard to get housing built is for a long time, a lot of people in in neighborhoods um, saw new construction and new buildings go up and prices went up mm -hmm. and new people moved in and suddenly they found themselves with their rent going up or getting displaced or the place I used to be able to get a cup of coffee at the bodega for a dollar is now a seven dollar latte place, yeah. you know, and, and, and those are real concerns, those are valid and it's our responsibility to speak to them. But that I think a lot of folks that are sort of professional, um, you know, NIMBYs and, and, and have very entrenched um, and, and I believe, you know, unhelpful uh, and, and kind of anti the spirit of this city, uh, you know, intentions, I think I've sort of hid behind those, um, those very valid community concerns to prevent almost anything new from getting built mm -hmm. and to kind of take advantage of the, you know, land use approval process in the city um, to, to kind of stop new projects that would actually add the housing we so desperately need. Mm -hmm. So we've been launching a pretty concerted effort to, to start to shift public opinion. And even just in the last few weeks, we saw a, um, I think, 900-plus apartment complex mm -hmm. in Astoria called Hallett's North got approved. Um, and, the, you know, the, 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 some of the lead voice, you know, the, the mayor was, was very supportive of that and, and kind of worked to get it done. But 
you know, the, the local council member there, Tiffany Kaman, who's, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a progressive and, and, you know, represents constituents that, I, you know, I think in previous years may have opposed it, said, we're not going to, you know, solve this crisis without, um, without building more housing and was willing to kind of take a stand against some real pressure. You know, we, we were able to just last week, um, and I think they're actually the full council's voting on it probably as we speak. Mm. Um, there's a, a, a smaller but, but also very important project um, uh, up in, in Throg's Neck that had, uh, you know, a ton of really loud community right. opposition right. Um, from folks that didn't want people moving to their neighborhood that didn't look like them. And we were able to counter that and we were able to, have, able to actually prevail. And that, that wasn't a given. So, you know, to me, there, I mean, there's a ton of stuff that I, that I work on that, um, that I think is really important, but like, when I, when I look back and, and feel like I was able to plug in, you know, get people, get reporters to focus on it, get external allies to sort of raise their voices, build that kind of cadence, and then you can see that, that the, 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 you know, support aligned in a way that people were able to take a stand and get something done. That, I think, is the most rewarding of all in, in terms of this work. I should ask you about that because we actually talked today about coalition building. Mm-hmm. Um, I would. What's that process like of going out and finding, um, building coalitions? That's got to be that's got to be difficult and trying to sort of align people's, if not values, then you know, then they're they're sort of incentivize them to sort of become part of this, you know, part of this effort. That's got to be a little tough. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it, it's in many ways you can you can activate people digitally, but I think you still kind of have to organize people in an analog way, right? Like. What you're talking about, you know, to be done effectively, and I think we, we are doing a pretty good job of it, you know, you can always do more, but, um, you know, re- requires having people who have, who, who, who come from various communities, both geographically and, you know, the Orthodox community or the African American community, you know, and, 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 um, and have credibility because they've been there and they know people and they've done the work, mm-hmm. right, and, and didn't just show up one day and say, Hey, I'm now the you know the liaison for the mayor to you know ex neighborhood or something like that, right? And 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 leveraging those relationships and leveraging relationships with you know external kind of credible messengers, you know who, who again like they may have a close relationship with the mayor, they may have a close relationship with me, but they're they're their own you know independent. They're not, they're not going to you know a- advocate for something if they don't you know on some fundamental level um, believe in it. But but it, it sort of starts with that, and then asking those folks to activate their networks, right? And, 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 and to, you know, kind of be, be messengers, tell the stories so that New Yorkers raise their voices. And that's, you know, to me, that's make or break because, you know, people, I think, I think most people, but certainly New Yorkers are, are skeptical and they're not wrong to be skeptical. And when the mayor stands up or, or you know, someone like one of us stands up and says, hey, the city's trying to do this and, and it's going to be really good, trust me. They go, I don't trust you, you know, but if they hear it from their pastor or if they hear it from their neighbor or if they hear it from, you know, a, a service provider that has actually worked in that field for decades, that is, again, like a known and trusted validator for them, um, then, then they start to be a little bit more open to it. And they feel like you're actually having a conversation with them rather than, you know, just kind of dictating from on high exactly. So... There, there's really no way to, to do the work without that. Like, that's got to be kind of the foundation, I think. Let me zoom out a little bit, because one of the things I wanted to address as you talk about working for the mayor is, how does, how do, and I'm going to say this, you probably laugh at me, <laughs> is it easy to get a deci- get to make a decision in the mayor's office? In other words, what's that, pro- what's that like? You know, do you just go to the mayor and say, I need you to do this, and you'd say, well, what's the, what's the, what are the pros and cons, and he makes a decision? How many people need to see it and review it and think about it before it even gets to his... Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, and, and uh, you know, it obviously depends on the, the nature of the question and the decision, right? And, and I mean, he's, he's busy, but he's also pretty accessible to, mm-hmm. to the, the staff. You know, we, we interact with him, you know, re- multiple times throughout the day. You know, if it's a simple decision point... I can text him, I can, you know, cut in at the end of a prep call and say, you know, Mayor, just want to get your approval on this, let us know if you, you know, have any issues with it. Um, if we're going to invest a billion dollars in city capital in something, that's going to probably take months of, mm-hmm. of planning and, you know, debate and, you know, presentations and making sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted because the last thing you want to do is 
you know, uh, in, you know, make an investment or or make a decision that's hard to roll back, um, and you know, and then and then you know, have it turn out that that it was misguided. Now that's what you do when you have the the you know luxury or the opportunity of a little bit of time, right. say you know, a major economic development investment or something like that. You often feel you don't have the time. Yeah, I mean, like you know, again, right now there there's you know there there is a, um, you know, there, there there's a, an asylum seeker crisis. Um, you know, there there are new families arriving on buses in New York City every day. You know, that are being sent from, you know, the Texas governor who is not coordinating, not letting anyone in in New York City government know that they're coming. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we we have to react to that. And and there you do have to make very very impactful decisions. Um, you know, on on an immediate basis, and you do the best you can with the the information you have at the time. And, you know, as you see it play out, like. Sometimes that decision ends up being, you know, not the perfect one, and you got to pivot. And, you know, one thing that I think is that that I that I really admire about this mayor is I think he, um, you know, he, he's first and foremost he's a really good listener. Mm-hmm. Like I've worked with people who, you know, if you meet with them to brief them, they're talking for two thirds of the briefing. Mm-hmm. He he's usually the last to speak in some of these conversations. He wants to hear from. His advisors, the experts who have, he's he's working on fifty things a day. He wants to hear the person who's been developing this strategy for the last forty eight hours or the last three years, right? And then he'll ask questions, and then he'll sort of weigh in. And he's not afraid to make decisions, and he's not afraid to admit if if you know if we need to change those decisions. He's not going to you know dig in if it turns out that we could be doing something differently or better. Um, but those, you know, that's a different process, obviously, right? Like something like this. There are daily calls, there are multiple daily calls where people are updating him and, and other members of the senior leadership team with new information about the, the you know, evolution of that crisis right. and, and, you know, decisions are getting made in, in near real time. And this is not just a city issue, this is really, a, it's a federal issue, it's Absolutely. a state issue, so you've got to, you've, this is, there's an intergovernmental approach to it as well. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, and you're, you know, you're, you're having conversations with counterparts, trying to get additional resources, I mean, yeah, there, there's... And there's really, I mean, it's 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 been remarkable. And as much as this is a, you know, it's I mean, it's 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 difficult, and it's it's you know, it's it's hard to, um, to you know, to, to see how folks are being exploited, and and you know, and, and the, the kind of limbo a lot of them have been left in, and, and we're doing the best we can to kind of provide services and stable housing. But it's also been kind of remarkable as someone who has worked in government for a long time to see just. There's almost not a single city agency or office that I think has not been involved mm. in in one form or another, whether it was, you know, helping provide social services to folks when they arrive at Port Authority or, you know, casting as wide a net possible to find, you know, underutilized spaces that we could maybe activate for temporary housing because our shelters are already beyond capacity. Um, so that's, you know, it, it's... Again, no one wishes they were working on this, but it's 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 kind of amazing to see the wealth of talent coming together. Now, that's an important point too, because you talk about the mayor needing to rely on or w- w- wanting to hear from his experts. Um, so, so is it because sometimes we hear about you know mayors or governors and others, presidents, you know, engaged in political patronage and they hire. You know, people that help them on a campaign, and maybe, and there's some truth to that, perhaps. But what's the, but, but there, there seems to be a tremendous need for and value in making sure that you just get really smart people who know their stuff around the table, and be, and then listening to those people. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right, and I think you know, we've, we've tried, and I think this mayor has tried to um, bring in people who are experts. Uh, he, you know, he, he's not, he's not someone with, with. Um, who fits neatly into ideological boxes. So he's, he's, you know, we have folks in senior leadership roles that are, you know, extremely progressive and, and you know, have, have a history of, of working in, in kind of progressive politics. We have, you know, former Republican elected officials, you know, serving the administration and, and you know, that, that, uh, uh, that, you know, have really great experience from, from, you know, their time in various office. So, you know, he's not afraid to tap someone that may not agree with him on all things um, if he thinks they have an important role to fill. And I think he also understands the value of trust and relationships. And I think he's also tried to, 
also bring in people that, you know, I, I, I had never, you know, had the opportunity to really work closely with him before. I, you know, I'd interacted with him a bit, you know, in, in, you know, time under the previous administration, but, you know, it, 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 it takes a, it takes a while for, for folks to really, um, you know, know exactly how to, how to work together, how to, how to best support, um, someone who's, you know, running so, something like the city of New York. Um, not that there's anything really like the city of New York. Uh, and also having people that like know him and are, are trusted counselors that can really help all of us figure out the best ways to help him lead the city in the direction it needs to go. It has also added a really valuable layer. So I think, you know, we've been fortunate to, to tap people with a, a real diversity of experience and, you know, we've still got some, some, um, some roles to fill and, and, you know, continuing to, to look for that kind of talent. So two quick questions before we close. Um, you talked early on, uh, you talked about how early on in your career and even up until you got this uh, uh, position with the mayor, um, that a lot of these opportunities came because of interactions you had with folks that you knew or just jumping into spaces. So talk, talk a little bit about the importance of relationship building and relying on those relationships, maintaining those relationships. Yeah, I, I mean, so... I I was like I said I was I was pretty fortunate like I, I I had no you know my parents were both teachers I had no real connection to government or politics I ran into the mayor of my town at a um, at a, a high school football game and, you know and and uh, I got I was on the student uh, the student council I wasn't I wasn't playing and uh, uh, you know we got to chatting and at the end of the conversation he asked me if I wanted an internship and like that that moment was the predicate for, for sort of everything else um, and was, was you know, some, some of it was luck, some of it was, again, I was, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to grow up in a place and in a family where that, that kind of somewhat random moment was even possible, right? But then it was kind of on me to leverage that for the next thing and the next mm -hmm. thing. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's a single job I've gotten that at some point wasn't flagged for me or I wasn't, you know, kind of recommended by someone I, I knew or had worked with in some capacity. And it's not, you know, I, I, think, I think it's easy to say like, oh, it's, it's who you know, not what you know, but it's actually who you know that knows what you know mm -hmm. and, and who can actually vouch, right? People get thousands of resumes. The ability to, to know, you know, if you call me, I know you, I trust your, you know, perspective. And you say, I've worked with this person. They're great, they can do the job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bump them to the top of the pile immediately because I, you know, otherwise I'm, I'm, you know, going off of a, a, a piece of paper. So mm -hmm. those relationships I think are, are really essential. And, you know, I, I do think, you know, when I, when I think about some of the, the impacts that the pandemic has had and you, and even the way kind of work, you know, is, is, is evolving. Um, you know, I, I, I think back to, just the, the social interactions that I had and, you know, working late in, in an office in a high pressure environment, the bonds that you form with colleagues in your early 20s and, and you know, beyond uh, really, I think, form the foundation for a lot of us of, of our professional network. And, you know, I, I hope that, that people who are kind of coming up now are, are finding those same opportunities. And I worry a little bit that, you know, people who are not necessarily in the same physical space, which again, is not going to work for everybody, but that's not, you know, setting them back a little bit because, it, you know, the, the, the older you get, the harder some of that is. So I think Yeah, I was about to ask you because all those high-pressure environments and those late nights, you're not looking forward to doing that at 50-something years old. Right, and, and I think, you know, people people have families, people have responsibilities. It, you know, it gets harder to, to, you know, hit a happy hour on a Thursday too. Okay. So, like, and, and harder to be the one at the office until midnight. So, you know, those moments, I think, really are, are you know, incredible for forming bonds. Mm. So last piece of advice for the students here, but also the students beyond th this room that are going to be watching this, what should they be paying attention to, you know, as they graduate and look for, look to be the next Anthony? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think um, just try to make the most out of opportunities. And, and again, we, we, you know, we, we don't all have equal opportunities, right? There, 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 you know, there, there are some folks who, who have a pretty clear path and a lot who don't. But, you know, one, one, one thing I think back on when, when, I, when I did the Kerry campaign in 2004, I was recommended, 
but they had a lot of people that were recommended and you know I think four or five weeks had gone by and they kept telling me yeah we're gonna find a trip we're gonna pull you up like just just hang tight and at a certain point I was like I, I gotta get out there or the campaign is gonna end it was like July mm. and so I drove down to DC I went to the campaign office I asked to see the um, the, the director of scheduling in advance uh, he, he you know came out like half hour later talked to me for two minutes seemed a little bit su surprised uh, but a few days later I was up and on the road and again that to me is sort of an example of you now if I had just shown up like a guy off the street would would they have pulled me up no probably not I mean the fact that I knew somebody and recommended mm -hmm. me was was again sort of a predicate for that that not everyone's gonna have those opportunities but figuring out what you can leverage and also what you maybe need to do to push it and kickstart it. And, you know, even even to this day, I find myself sometimes being like, oh, like, I, you know, I haven't heard back from somebody, but I don't want to hound them. I don't want to bother them. Like, bother people. You know, like, don't, like you know, when, when, when people email me wanting to grab a coffee and I'm having a crazy day and I don't see it and then they, like, bump it the next day, I'm never like, how, how rude of them to, to chase me. I'm actually glad because... I want to be helpful. I want to talk to people. So that's the thing I kind of said to everybody. Like, don't be afraid to be a little aggressive in that sense and, and make sure that you're trying to figure out how to, how to leverage any, any relationship, any opportunity you've got. Well, I thank you that it only took one call for you to <laughs> agree to, to do this. Thank yeah, this you was, so much this was a blast. Yeah, thanks for inviting thank, me. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks.